So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner, Seminars, and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Service Through Policy Research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a search engine that is easy to navigate? And do you want it free? If you are a student, researcher, or teacher looking for socioeconomic references and materials, then SERPI is for you. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website at www.pids.gov.ph and click the SERPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERPI is an online database of socioeconomic studies and materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and other academic and research institutions. SERPI has a wide variety of socioeconomic materials such as journal articles, books, working papers, policy notes, research papers, and newsletters. SERPI has 52 partner institutions that contribute publications to the database. SERPI has a wide coverage of materials encompassing 20 research themes. You can search by keyword or author, by publication type, by research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 materials with full text that you can download for free. Enjoy searching! Visit SERPI now and follow us on Facebook. You may also send a message for inquiries. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan yung batas at polisiya para mas makita nila yung epekto at resulta nito. <sighs> Pag naroli tayo, wala tayo may sasagot. Kaya dapat pag-aralan din natin. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan ng mga batas at polisiya para malaman nila kung epektibo ba ito sa karamihan o magiging problema lang. Kung walang basihan ng isang batas, basta na lamang ipatutupad at walang pulso na kinukuha sa mga mamamayan, eh, mahirap. Mahalagang isailalim sa masusing pagsusuri ang mga polisiya at programa ng pamahalaan bago pa man ito ipatupad. Dapat ring ipagpatuloy ang pagsubaybay o pagmonitor sa mga ito habang ipinapatupad hanggang sa matapos ang kanilang implementasyon. 
Dito pumapasok ang tungkuli na ginagampanan ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Ang PIDS ang siyang sangay ng pamahalaan na naatasang gumawa ng pag-aaral at pananaliksik at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas at iba't ibang sangay ng gobyerno tungkol sa mga programa at polisiya sa pamahalaan upang masigurong matugunan nito ang socio-economic needs ng ating bansa. Pag pinag-aralan, mas effective! So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, or PIDS, has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner, Seminars, and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Service through policy research.
to all. We hope that you are all uh, safe and sound after the destructive uh, typhoon that we had last week. I'm Sheila Sear and I will be moderating this event. Welcome to the PIDS webinar series where we'll tackle development issues based on data and evidence. The, en the Enhampered Movement of Labor is an important feature of the of the uh, ASEAN economic integration. Mutual, mutual recognition arrangements, or MRA, promote the free flow of skilled professionals in ASEAN by enabling the qualifications of professionals from one country to be recognized by other signatory countries. MRAs are envisioned to improve the quality of ASEAN professionals by setting competency, competency standards, licensing and certification requirements, and promoting continuing professional development. This afternoon, we will know to what extent MRAs are helping the Philippines and our skilled professionals in terms of human resource development and what we need to do further to make this policy instrument work to our advantage. To formally open our event, may I call on the president of PIDS, Dr. Celia Reyes. Mamsel? Thank you, Sheila. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, please allow me to acknowledge the presence of the following. PRC Commissioner Jose Cueto Jr., Chad Commissioner Aldrin Darilag, Gole Assistant Secretary Dominique Rubia Tutay, DFA Acting Assistant Secretary Enrico Foss, TESDA Executive Director Maria Susan de la Rama, Dole ILS Executive Director Ama Carisma Lobrin Satumba, BSP Deputy Director Maria Teresa Duenas, DBM Director Ahmad Usman, and from NEDA we have Director Richard Emerson Ballester and Regional Director Roan Bacal, and Assistant Regional Director Ferdinand Tumaliwan. And from PAPCOM we have Regional Director Joy Silvano. This afternoon we're also joined by a member of the PIDS Board of Trustees, Attorney Rafael Lotelia. And from Sambuanga City, we have Councillor L. King Omaga. And from the private sector, we have CPRM Consultant uh, Incorporated Vice President Manjit Sohal and Employers Confederation of the Philippines Director General Jose Roland Moya. And from the academe, we have representatives um, from different universities. Uh, we have from the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, we have President Manuel Muhi. Cagayan State University President Urduha Tejada, Southern Luzon State University Vice President for Planning, Research, Production, and Development, Marisa Esperal, Mater Dei Academy Dean Rosario Alonso, Cavite State University Dean Evelyn Del Mundo, UP Cebu Vice Chancellor for Administration, Rina Guerra, Bulacan State University Vice Chancellor for Instruction, Research, and Extension, Cecilia Geronimo, and from the CSO um, NGOs and international organizations. We have from ILO Philippines Country Director Khalid Hassan, Philippine Society of Mechanical Engineers Vice President Simeon Perez, Masagana Sakahan Incorporated Director Daniel Agustin, and EduTech Philippines Vice President for Academics Dari Dakanay. Let me also greet our guest colleagues from the government, academe, civil society, media, private sector, as well as those who are watching through the PIDS Facebook page. Good afternoon and welcome to our weekly webinar. This is already our 26th virtual event since we started um, this webinar series in May, and I think everybody is already accustomed to attending online events as part of the new normal. This afternoon, our speaker, De La Salle University Distinguished Professor Tereso Tuliao, will share the highlights of the PIDS research paper titled Assessing the Readiness of Filipino MRA-Supported Professions to Participate in the Mobility of Skilled Labor in the ASEAN Region, Lessons for APEC Economies, which he co-authored with Asian Institute Management Associate Director Jan Paolo Rivera and De La Salle University Associate Professor Cynthia Cudia. The study looked into the human resource development dimension of the various mutual recognition arrangements, or MRAs, of the Philippines with ASEAN countries and the contributions of these MRAs to the labor participation of Filipino skilled professionals in the region. Specifically, the research team assessed how MRAs contributed to improving the quality of professionals in ASEAN member states. 
the authors also reviewed the best practices of Filipino professions with MRA support in the accountancy services, medical services, architect architectural services, engineering services, and tourism services. Further, it identified challenges faced by Filipino professionals engaged in these professions in complying with the respective MRAs and proposed policy recommendations on how to address them. MRAs are crucial, especially in the pursuit of deeper economic integration in the ASEAN and improving labor mobility in the region. Labor migration will remain a key feature of the country's economy as people will continue to look for lucrative jobs over overseas. According to the 2019 survey on overseas Filipinos released by the Philippine Statistics Authority, about 2.2 million Filipinos are working abroad for the period April to September 2019. The survey also showed that the total OFW remittances during this period they were estimated at 211.9 billion pesos. This included cash sent home, cash brought home, and remittance in kind. Considering that OFW remittances play a significant role in the country's economic growth and stability, the government has taken several steps to ensure that we remain competitive and at par with counterparts in the ASEAN region. The Philippines, along with other ASEAN member countries, agreed on the ASEAN Qualifications Reference Framework, or the AQRF, as a common reference framework to enable comparisons of education qualifications across the region. It supports recognition of educational qualifications, encourages lifelong learning, and promotes learner and worker mobility, among others. Complementing the AQRF is the Philippine Qualifications Framework, or the PQF, created through Executive Order No. 83 issued in 2012 by then-President Benigno Aquino III. The PQF sets the education and training standards for workers to ensure consistency with the ASEAN Qualifications Framework. Aside from adopting national standards and levels of outcomes of education and training, it aims to support the development of pathways and equivalences and align domestic qualification standards with international qualifications to foster labor mobility. Filipino professionals need to have regionally or internationally recognized qualifications to engage in the ASEAN labor market easily. We have also adopted the K-12 basic education curriculum under the Department of Education. Adding two years of senior high school to our basic education makes it comparable with international curriculum and standards. The Professional Regulation Commission has also issued guidelines on the continuing professional development to maintain and enhance Filipino professionals' competence. The CPD guidelines ensure the alignment of competencies and qualifications of professionals at the national, regional, and international levels. It also warrants the development and adoption of mechanisms for the validation, accreditation, and recognition of formal, non-formal, and informal learning outcomes, including professional work experiences. Lastly, it promotes the enhancement of core competencies and advocates the learning of new skills to respond to the labor market demand and industry needs in the national, regional, and international domains. To help us know more of these topics, we have invited Commissioner Yolanda Reyes of the Professional Regulation Commission and Dr. Arnel Onesimo Uy, Chairperson of the Commission on Higher Education's Technical Committee on Accountancy, as discussants in today's webinar. Let me take this opportunity to thank Commissioner Reyes and Dr. Uy for accepting our invitation. It's our pleasure to have you in this virtual seminar. I would also like to thank our PIDS webinar team led by Dr. Sheila Siar for organizing the webinars to disseminate our research findings to an even wider audience during the pandemic. To our viewers, I hope you will all stay until the end of the webinar and actively participate during the open forum. I now give back the floor to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mamsel. Friends, before we um, have the presentation, may I remind you about our house rules. So for all attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry to prevent background noise, but this doesn't mean that you cannot join in the discussion. So to join the open forum, just use the chat box, which is located at the lower part of uh, your screen. Just type your name, your affiliation, and your question, and I will read your question during the open forum. For all our viewers on Facebook, you are also uh, very much welcome to participate in the discussion. Just use the comment section um, on Facebook 
And uh, since we have limited time, please make your questions um, concise and uh, related to the webinar topic. Okay. And for all our speakers, and I'm referring to our presenter and um, our discussants, a gentle reminder, please, to observe the time allotted for your talk. So we are giving our presenter a maximum of 35 minutes and our discussants uh, 15 minutes each. And you will hear an alert bell when you only have five minutes left and another bell when your time is up. Okay. As mentioned by Dr. Reyes, the PIDS study that we are featuring today was conducted by three PIDS uh, consultants, uh, namely Dr. John Paulo Rivera of the Asian Institute of Management and uh, Dr. Cynthia Cudia and Dr. Teresa Tuliao, who are both from the De La Salle University. The presentation will be delivered by Dr. Tuliao. Dr. Tuliao is a university fellow, a young professor of economics, he is also uh, the director uh, of the Angelo King Institute for Economics and Business Studies. He is also the editor-in-chief of the DLSU uh, Business and Economics Review and the former dean of the College of Business and Economics of the LSU. He has been teaching for more than uh, four decades at the LSU, and he was uh, also a visiting professor and scholar at various institutions in Japan, the USA, China, Thailand, France, and Laos. As a researcher, he has published several articles, monographs, and books in Filipino and English in the fields of economics, of education, trade in services, movement of natural persons, and migration and remittances. Friends, Dr. Teresa Puliao. Sir? Oh, thank you very much, Sheila, for that uh, kind introduction. I think that uh, uh, note is uh, quite dated because uh, that was written 10 years ago. Uh, I've been teaching for close to 50 years at the uh, But anyway, thank you again. And uh, I also want to thank uh, Celia Reyes, Dr. Celia Reyes, for, uh, you know, summarizing our uh, uh, research report. So probably this is not, uh, uh, I will not uh, use the entire 35 minutes because uh, it has been introduced earlier. So the title is Assessing the Readiness of Filipino uh, uh, MRA, Supported Professions to Participate in the Mobility of Skilled Labor in the ASEAN. This uh, uh, Excuse me. Uh, this was written uh, by uh, a team uh, composed of Dr. Paolo, John Paolo Rivera of the Asian Institute of Management, uh, Dr. Cynthia Pudia, who is the Associate Dean of uh, the College of Business of De La Salle, and, and yours truly. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, it's an introduction. Um, Mutual recognition arrangement or MRAs are meant for uh, to facilitate skilled labor mobility in the region. And why do we need skilled labor mobility? Because that's one of the pillars of the ASEAN economic community to make the region uh, uh, competitive and and establish a uh, a single production. A base in the region. Next slide, please. Uh, skilled labor mobility is part of movement of natural persons, okay? And this is one of the modes of supply under the general agreement on trade and services and in the ASEAN, the ASEAN framework agreement on trade and services. It covers natural persons who are at either service providers or who work for a service supplier. So movement of natural persons is different from temporary movement or temporary migration of laborers. And the ASEAN uh, documents are very clear about the uh, ASEAN framework for trade and services. And, and it's really meant for movement of natural persons to facilitate 
trade in services. Next slide, please. So MRAs is meant to uh, work for the adoption of best practices and standards in and qualifications in the region and to make sure that the, uh, uh, the qualifications of uh, professionals or skilled professionals in the region are comparable. Okay. Next slide. So, so far we have eight mutual recognition arrangement in ASEAN, okay? Uh, engineering services, nursing services, architectural services, serving qualifications, dental practitioners, medical practitioners, accountancy and tourism professionals. So these MRAs are meant to provide recognition mechanisms on how to recognize equivalences of registration, licensing requirements, reciprocity requirements, as well as education and, 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 and experience. So that with this uh, recognition mechanisms, okay, that will facilitate uh, movement of skilled professionals within the region. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Before we, I go to the point of inquiry, I, I would like to just make a, a, a very important note, okay? Uh, mutual recognition arrangements are the necessary conditions for mobility of skilled professionals. There is a sufficient condition, and that sufficient condition is that domestic regulation should allow their entry, okay? So even if our professionals are comparable with uh, other professionals in the region, if other ASEAN member states are not willing to allow entry, then that's it. Now, given that, you know, people were asking me, so why study mutual recognition arrangements? Well, because there are human resource implications under MRN. So the uh, continuing uh, education, continuing professional education and other uh, requirements are not only meant for compliance, but rather meant to improve the human resource development of this country. So even if we have an MRA, but other countries are not willing to allow entry, it's still good for the Philippines to improve its human resources through education, through uh, various experiences, and continuing professional education. Next slide, please. So that's it, okay? So the general objective is to explore how, how the Philippines can prepare its skilled professionals to take advantage of participating in the ASEAN labor market, given existing MRAs and the establishments of the ASEAN economic community, allowing for easier labor mobility subject to domestic regulations. So uh, we have studied uh, the following uh, professional groups, accountancy, medical, medicine, architecture, engineering services, and tourism. Next slide, please. So uh, we have seen, okay, uh, uh, the three uh, categories of these uh, professions. Uh, the highly regulated dental services, nursing services, and medical uh, practitioners uh, for obvious reasons because uh, this involves lives, okay? And then the regulated ones, uh, accountancy, architecture, and engineering services, and unregulated uh, profession, and that is tourism. Uh, of professionals. Next slide, please. 
So the specific objectives, okay, explore the contributions of MRAs in improving the quality of professionals in ASEAN. So let me emphasize that. So this one, this study is meant, okay, to use mutual recognition arrangements as an avenue for improving the human resource development of uh, professionals in ASEAN and in particular in the Philippines. To review best practices among identified professional groups in the Philippines that can be shared with other professionals so that they can attain regional and international comparability. Identify the challenges facing Filipino professionals in complying with the respective MRAs and to create policy recommendations that can enhance uh, best practices and address the challenges of Filipino professionals. Next slide, please. So the significance of the studies I said is not only to contribute to the mobility of skilled professionals in the region and to make it uh, uh, competitive in trade, okay? but to contribute, this study is also meant to contribute to the various ways we can create human resource uh, in this country in terms of social capital, in terms of human capital, and in terms of uh, uh, knowledge capital through education, training, graduate education, and continuing professional uh, education. So as I said, we would like to emphasize the importance of the human resource development dimension as a critical aspect of MRA compliance and competitiveness. Next slide, please. So this is our framework. We have internal factors uh, that contribute to the readiness of Filipino professionals in participating in the movement of natural persons. Uh, this includes uh, education, assessment and uh, examination, continuing professional development, experience, accreditation, certification, and licensing, research, and publications, okay? So our representative of Commissioner Reyes can uh, articulate this uh, more in details. And then, of course, we have external factors, uh, mostly on mutual recognition. So the agreement of uh, member states to recognize the various uh, internal factors in various economies. And then you have transnational in issues, uh, intention to participate, okay? So, you know, we have several, uh, several uh, professions and there are only eight in a span of more than 15 years that uh, were agreed upon because it takes an intention and political uh, leadership on the part of uh, the governments to participate in these uh, discussions, as well as the private sector and the professions. Uh, next slide, please. So the methodology is a, uh, a library research. Uh, okay, so we have literature review and analysis of documents. And then uh, from this uh, documents, okay, we have the first draft. And this first draft was given to uh, you know, potential key informants for the validation workshop, okay? And uh, so to encourage them to participate, okay? So we really produce, okay, the first draft of the paper, okay? It's not only an outline, but the real first draft. And then from there, we have a workshop identifying the issues. And then, of course, whether they agree or disagree with our uh, analysis, and from that, uh, we assessed the readiness of Filipino professionals and came up with policy recommendations for uh, enhancement of best practices and address the challenges faced by Filipino professionals to be MRA compliant. Next slide, please. So the validation 
Mission Workshop, I don't know when was this done. Okay, this was, uh, I think, a year or two years ago. Okay, so we have various professional groups. For accountancy, we have representatives from the La Salle uh, uh, Department of Accountancy and the UST College of Accountancy. For medicine, we have a representative from the Philippine Medical Association. For ar architecture, we have Palafox Associates. For engineering, we have the Philippine Institute of Chemical Engineers and the College of Engineering of Dallasal University. And for tourism and hospitality, we have the Lyceum of the Philippines University College of International Tourism and Hospitality Management and AIM Conference Centers, Manila, Raja Travel Corporation, and AIM, uh, Dr. Andrew Stan Center for Tourism. Next slide, please. So what are the discussion points? On faculty, for somewhat uh, uh, comparable, but uh, of course, even if we are comparable, as I said, uh, this is not meant for just compliance or comparability. It's really how to improve. So we are just uh, meeting uh, the minimum requirements for, for teaching, okay, which is a master's degree and not all of our uh, college professors have master's degree, okay? Only, in fact, for PhD, it's even worse. We only have, what, 13% of our uh, faculty members in uh, the 2,000 or more higher educational institutions have uh, master's degree, uh, has, uh, what do you call this, a doctorate degree, for master's degree, I think it's 33%, okay? So, I mean, 65%, okay, two thirds of our faculty members are still undergraduates, okay? So, but uh, according to our discussion, okay, uh, some of the best uh, schools are comparable with regional standards. Next slide, please. On curriculum, okay, again, we are comparable with re regional and international standards because we follow, uh, you know, uh, the international standards, okay, and these are recognized by international bodies. Next slide, please. Now, this one is a, uh, okay, on uh, continuing professional education uh, or continuing professional development. So, the key informants felt that it's too regulatory and there is a need for liberalization. In fact, my take on this is that, uh, yes, we are complying. We have continuing uh, professional education. In fact, we have legislated or mandated that uh, uh, it is a requirement for the, the renewal of licenses to have continuing professional uh, education. So the criticism there is not uh, whether we lack or uh, we have uh, CPE, but rather what uh, the composition of this continuing professional education. So I think we are, uh, we can further exploit this opportunity to improve, for example, our research and our innovation, okay? among our professionals. And that's part of CPE. It's not only attending seminars and getting credits. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, again, on research, okay? Uh, I think we're lagging behind, okay? Uh, we are weak in research. There's no uh, weak research culture, a lack of scientists. Uh, this is part of enhancing knowledge capital. So although we are good in human capital because our uh, uh, because of the licensure examination and the uh, bachelor's degree, but in terms of knowledge capital, the creation of new knowledge done through research, publication, okay, and graduate education, uh, we're lagging behind. I don't know. We have some statistics on this. Thank okay. you. A per senator that uh, the Philippines lacks 19,000 scientists in research and development, okay? I don't want to quote another senator. This is uh, live, okay, about uh, 
the criticism of this uh, senator on the, the value of research. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a deployment, okay. Uh, next slide, okay. Uh, OFWs, and these are uh, remittances, okay. Next slide, and this is the most important slide, okay. Uh, here. Uh, related to uh, our topic on research and the formation of knowledge capital. This is a, uh, the number of publications in Scopus journals. These are index journals, okay. Uh, for a span of more than for 20 years, okay, from 1996 to 2017. Look at accounting. We boast that we have the best accountants in the region, if not in the world, and yet we are only producing 146 compared to Singapore, which is a small economy of 803 publications, Malaysia 915, even a smaller uh, country than the Philippines, okay? So, um, architecture 17, the highest is Singapore, 588. In chemical engineering, the same thing. Uh, engineering, uh, the same pattern. Medicine, in medicine, we have a lot, okay, 6,952. Uh, this was done by uh, the doctors from the UP College of Medicine uh, and also from uh, PGH as well as from the University of Santo Tomas, okay? But you know, 6,952 is nothing compared to the 54,582 produced by, uh, by Singapore, okay? Thailand is producing. And, and this is the reason, you know, some people, uh, tourism has 28, okay? Uh, let, let me uh, discuss this further, okay? There is a, uh, a view among many professionals, okay, and say that research is not important. Research is very, uh, uh, very expensive, which is true. It is expensive. It is also true that not all research will lead to inventions or will lead to innovations or will lead to new products. But having said that, even if it's only 1%, okay, or 10%, okay, of this research, okay, come out to be uh, new inventions or, or innovations, well, that's only 69 for the Philippines, make it 70, but for Singapore, that's uh, what, 545 new innovations. So that's it. Even if 90% is wasted, the 10% of this research will lead us to innovations and improvement of our production as well as our services. Not to mention, if our faculty members are engaged in research, then the quality of education in this country will improve. So uh, that's my take on this. I'm sure this will be a, uh, a topic of discussion later on, okay? And next slide, please. On licensure examination, so it varies according to professional groups. So what was, uh, what emerged during the, uh, the discussion, a focus group discussion, is the appropriateness of allowing fresh graduates to take licensure examination immediately. For other professions, it's allowed. For architecture and medicine, it requires prior work. In fact, by international standards, okay, they require three years of work experience before taking the licensure examinations. But in this country, particularly in, in accountancy, I, work, I used to be the dean of the College of Business and Economics at De La Salle University, okay? So we take pride, okay, of our fresh graduates in, who uh, land in the, the top 10, okay? 
But uh, many of this, okay, uh, in my previous studies, okay, only 20% of this license accountants end up in public accounting. So this licensure examination are not meant really to for, for them to, to qualify to do to auditing and accounting. To me, okay, this is a personal view, it's more of a, uh, a signal that if you pass this licensure, a very difficult licensure examination, then, you know, you are a good worker. You, you can be a, you have a, uh, uh, a place in this, uh, in the, in this, uh, in this company. Okay. So it is a signal that you are equipped with good qualities. Next slide. Okay. Where well, I'm in the summary. Okay. As I said, MRAs have compelled professionals to continuously improve on their respective crafts. As I said previously, even if we enter into mutual recognition arrangements, it does not follow that there will be movement of skilled workers or skilled professionals that is dependent on domestic regulations. Having said that, okay, this requirement stipulated in mutual recognition arran arrangements compelled sending countries to upgrade their educational systems, training, accreditation, certification, licensing, and professional regulatory frameworks to enforce higher standards in the conduct of professional service. So this is something, okay, even if this MRAs will not facilitate movement, okay, the contribution of this, of these MRAs, is to improve our human resources in terms of improving our educational standards, improving our research, improving our continuing professional education, and so forth and so Filipino professionals are generally comparable with other ASEAN professionals. I mean, as I said, we are comparable, but we're not working for comparability. We want to improve further, okay? We want to go beyond comparability. Next slide, please. So no single ASEAN member states uh, serves as benchmark or best practices. Uh, varying levels of development among ASEAN member states are not yet willing to relinquish full control over their professional standards. Okay, you know, that's why, you know, the, the name uh, Professional Regulatory Commission, okay? A regulation Commission, it, it, it's highly regulatory. I'm not questioning the regulations, okay, there, okay? In economics, okay, there is a basis for regulation. And one of that is what we call asymmetric information. The information that is known by the service providers is not known to the consumers of the service. And that is bad for the consumers because they may get wrong professional advice, wrong professional service. I mean, uh, you've heard of malpractices in the medical profession and the dental profession and so forth and so on. Okay. So this is the basis of regulations to address that asymmetric information. But what we are saying is that Okay, this is it, okay. We also have to be developmental, that our professionals can still improve. In this country, you know, after 
taking the licensure examination, that's it. We don't take graduate education. Okay, we don't publish because we're already certified. I mean, now that uh, Dr. Celia Reyes mentioned about the Philippine Qualifications Framework, I think that is the right road uh, to take in the ASEAN uh, Qualifications Framework, okay? Or what TESDA is doing, certification, not licensing. We have to certify, you know, everyone, but not license, because licensing is more, uh, <laughs> not all, okay? There are select, the highly regulated ones, okay? Uh, I am for the licensing of uh, medical doctors, uh, dentists, okay, uh, nurses, of course. But there are some, okay, professions, you know, just to keep their monopoly power, uh, sought Congress to make their profession a regulated one, okay? So, and uh, again, that, uh, we'll discuss that during the open forum. And then generation of knowledge through research mm -hmm. stimulates technological development and creation new practices that upgrade human resource practices. We should emphasize the role of research. This country will only move, okay, if we develop knowledge capital. It's not only the work of Chad, it's also the work of PRC to contribute in knowledge building because that's part of nation building. And lastly, as okay, oh, that's it. Okay. To sustain this readiness, continuous improvement in education of uh, faculty members handling professional degree programs, not only through development continuing professional development, but also through research and publications, okay? Very, very, okay, uh, because we're lagging behind, okay, uh, on research and development, just to, uh, okay? Uh, the entire publication of the Philippines in Scopus journals for the past 20 years is even lower than the 2018 publication of Singapore. That's something, okay? Continuing professional development should be developmental, more than, rather, okay? More than regulatory. I mean, I I'm not discounting the regulatory function. It is needed. But we also need to be developmental in this continuing professional education and development. Although not all practicable research outputs can generate patents, innovations, and new technologies that can contribute to the development of society in the long run. So with that, thank you very much. I heard the sounds that I have to stop. Thank you. Next slide. I think the next slide is thank you. Okay, well, well, the link, okay. uh, let me just read this, okay. Uh, because this was funded by the Philippine Apex Study Center Network, and the criticism of the evaluators is that uh, it's too ASEAN focused. Although it's ASEAN focused, most of the ASEAN uh, member states are also members of the Apex. Uh, so what are the lessons for the Apex economies, okay? Uh, there is a link between MRAs and human resource development, okay? not only in the development of social capital, but the development of human capital and knowledge capital. Uh, strengthen the association of APEC universities towards benchmarking of curriculum, pedagogies, and learning standards, okay? ASEAN is a model here. The ASEAN University Network is benchmarking on curriculum, pedagogies, and learning standards. And to some extent, you know, one of the reasons why these uh, MRAs uh, uh, were forged was uh, through the ASEAN University uh, Network. So coming together of regulators and professional organizations should complement the discussions of 
higher educational institution. So, you know, it takes a lot of uh, stakeholders to form a uh, mutual recognition arrangement. And not only that, it takes a lot of time and effort. So, uh, next slide. I think that's it. Thank you very much for listening. I hope uh, uh, I'll get your uh, reaction later on. Thank you. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tuliao, for that uh, clear presentation of the study's uh, results and recommendations. Very um, important points uh, you underscored about uh, the uh, the need to beef up our research uh, capacity to um, um, enhance uh, our so to build our knowledge capital in order to, en to enhance the country's innovation um, potential where we uh, uh, really land. Okay, so friends, um, we invited um, uh, two uh, panelists, two experts, to uh, give uh, their uh, comments about the study's uh, findings and recommendations. And actually, this um, two experts belong to two of the professions covered by uh, the study. And our first discussant is a uh, commissioner at the Professional Regulation uh, Commission, the PRC, and an architect by profession. Before her stint at the PRC, she was the dean of uh, the University of Santo Tomas College of Ar Architecture and Fine Arts, and she's also the current chairman of the uh, Commission on Higher Education's Technical Panel for Architecture, Interior Design, Landscape Design, Fine Arts, and Environmental Planning Education, as well as that of the Environmental Management Cluster of the Multisectoral Governance Council of the City of San Fernando. Prior to that, she also served as chairman of the APEC Architect Project Monitoring Committee, Philippine Section, and held the same position at the ASEAN Architect Council. Friends, Commissioner Yolanda Reyes, ma'am. Thank you very much for the generous introduction. Uh, my congratulations to our speaker, Dr. Uh, Tulio uh, Jr., uh, Teresa Tulio. Uh, okay, let me share PRC's activities, programs, and initiatives to support our Filipino professionals uh, in actively participating on this uh, mutual recognition arrangements and cross-border mobility. So let me just uh, share my, uh, my slides. Uh, we have an outline, uh, but I will do my best to finish uh, on the allotted time. All right, so this is the outline, and I would like to start immediately with the ASEAN uh, Mutual Recognition Arrangements. Actually, in under uh, in the PRC, we have 18 professions uh, which can be grouped into health sector, which would include medicine, dentistry, and nursing. And uh, for business sector, uh, we have architecture, engineering, accountancy, and surveying. We are saying 18 because uh, engineering professions have 12 disciplines. So we have the disciplines here uh, indicated. And, uh, and the last is uh, tourism, which is actually not... Uh, it is not uh, uh, regulated, so I will not be uh, speaking about uh, tourism. And as indicated uh, earlier, as agreed in the requirements of uh, assessment statements in the in our MRAs, I'm an architect by profession, so I'm also with the AA. And uh, so we have uh, five uh, qualification requirements to become ASEAN professionals, and uh, the three are. For the engineers, the architects, and the CPAs, they have ASEAN registries. While for medicine, dentistry, and nursing, as long as they are uh, they are qualified in their uh, in their in, in the agreed assessment statements, then they can uh, practice. They can do already cross border practice. So first, uh, the requirements is uh, on education. You have to be a graduate of a college or university recognized and accredited by the government of the home country. In our case, it is CHED. The second is the registration. That means that you must have passed a licensure examination and the registered in, uh, in the home country as well. So in our case, the PRC. And for experience, they differ in the experience uh, qualifications. 
For the engineers, it is seven years. For architecture, 10 years. ASEAN uh, CPAs, uh, it's uh, three years. For the medicine and the dentistry, it's five years uh, experience. And the nursing, three years uh, experience, uh, minimum experience uh, required. And uh, CPD, uh, also that they must be compliant to the CPD requirements of the home country. And it, you, must have a, you must have an institutionalized program uh, for this. And, uh, and the last is that you must have a certificate from the PRA or the Professional uh, Regulatory Authority of each country. In our case, our PRC and the, uh, and the boards, that you don't have any violation of professional and ethical standards, both in the local and international Seen. So we just have here a chart of the number of professionals in the ASEAN registry. Uh, as I mentioned, there are only three with registers now. For surveying, they are still in the negotiating table because uh, uh, they have not agreed yet on, uh, they have not completed their MRAs. So uh, next, um, you, we also have here, we have also an established ASEAN Qualifications Reference Framework. I know you are already very familiar with this, where qualifications, qualification levels of professionals will be identified on the center, which is the yellow color, and each country must have their own uh, qualification frameworks, which will lead us to the PQF, and uh, I know you are all very well aware of this, and I would just like to uh, uh, emphasize two, um, two objectives that will be related directly for this, uh, and that is to enable access to qualifications and assist individuals to move easily and readily between different education and training sectors, and also to align domestic qualification standards with international standards. And uh, this is also a diagram which you can see the levels uh, the levels on the yellow color, and uh, we have a basic education under the ed, the blue color under the TESDA, the uh, green and the uh, royal blue color under CHED, uh, which means that you will be on level six if you are a uh, baccalaureate degree, ho degree holder. If you are a master of degree holder, then you're on level seven and level eight for a doctorate uh, degree. And for the uh, professional track, we are including here a professional track because this is a challenge given to PRC in coming up with an institute, institutionalized program in developing pathways and equivalencies where practicing professionals can access to opportunities in, the, in recognition and uh, make it easy for them to move from one level to another. So uh, this is a roadmap which is uh, actually all professions have their own roadmap. And this is usually a product of the, of the board, of the APOS, the industry, and the academe. And uh, the levels uh, from, for one level to go to the next level, the yellow ribs here would show that this would be the continuing professional development programs which as mentioned earlier, it's not just a matter of uh, attending seminars or attending conferences, it has to lead you somewhere. And this is what we are doing now in the PRC to make sure that there is a pathway where our professionals can readily move from one level to another. And this will lead us to our career progression and specialization program. And uh, there are actually two laws which uh, made clear that uh, uh, it mandates, and this is the CPD and the PQF law, where it, there's a mandate to the, on the institutionalization and implementation of a program on career progression and specialization, so that our professional can have a, a clear, very clear direction and pathway, and so they will also be properly guided. So very quick, uh, very quick definition. It refers to the uh, career progression is the is moving towards a more advanced state in a person's qualification, job, title, position, or profession. And it also outlines the route 
that one may follow in order to reach identified career development goals. And specialization is the field of practice of a profession for a particular area of knowledge or process of becoming an expert in a particular field of professional practice. So who are involved in the formulation and implementation of this career uh, and specialization program? Uh, so Commission. So in order, we come actually came up with 12 phases in formulating the CPS. And uh, we have to identify the career pathway, and this should be done by each profession. Each profession must be able to go through these uh, 12 phases of the CPS uh, program. So they have to identify uh, the pathway, the identification title, the qualification titles, the competency levels, and also they will be uh, consulting with their with other PRBs, uh, with other boards, because uh, we have to avoid overlapping and encroachment of specialization qualification titles. And they have to consult uh, their stakeholders. There, should, there would be public consultations, and uh, this will be approved by the, uh, by the PRBs and the and also by the committee, the general or the main central committee of the CPSP program under PRC. And uh, this will later be uh, forwarded to our legal service and it will be submitted, a final draft will be submitted to uh, CSC for their comments. And uh, after, after um, including those comments or going over those comments, it will be submitted to the commission for approval. And uh, the last step would be a public orientation to all the uh, professionals. So uh, how does it go from the commission? It gives the, it requires the boards to create their own professions, uh, career progression and specialization program committee. And CATS committee, CATS is a credit accumulation and transfer systems, but I will not discuss that uh, in this, uh, in this uh, for this time. And the, uh, and the professions uh, CPSP committees will be made up of five to seven members, the chair being a member of the board, and then uh, members from APO, academe, industry, and government. So we have invited here directors, undersecretaries to be members of uh, the, uh, the CATS committee, the uh, CPSP uh, committee. And in turn, the the uh, professions uh, committee now will call out for the organized specialty groups, which will be under them. So they can have three, five, 12, 20 specialty societies or groups, but uh, whatever their profession has, like medicine, they are very well organized. They, are, they have a lot of specialties already, specialty uh, societies. So they will have a lot of uh, specialty societies. And for those who do not have specialty groups yet, or even specializations because they are relatively new uh, professions, uh, regulated professions, then they can form their own. And uh, also the APOS or the professional organizations can nominate also their existing uh, specialty committees uh, in the, uh, which are part of their uh, organization. And they will just submit this to the specialty, uh, to the uh, committee for evaluation and, uh, and uh, approval. And uh, what does the specialty society do? It can be an organization, it could be a specialty board, it could be a specialty group. So they will uh, identify career pathways for both level seven and level eight, Identif identification of uh, qualification titles. They will identify program outcomes Qualification competencies, because we're talking of uh, degrees, uh, uh, competency, degree of uh, professional practice, and the learning outcomes that have been learned through the years in their practice. And they have to identify knowledge, skills, values, applications, and degree of independence. And uh, these uh, societies can also uh, 
propose to the CPD providers programs and modules that will bridge gaps uh, for professional attainment of uh, required uh, qualifications. So in that uh, fishbone roadmap that I presented to you earlier, those uh, the uh, modules could be uh, given out by providers. Providers can be schools, they can, they are, uh, can be uh, in government or in private. And uh, also, uh, the applicants, when they apply, they have to self-evaluate first before they apply to minimize deferments and, uh, and disapprovals. And uh, so when the specialty societies approves or agree that one professional is qualified uh, or groups of professionals are qualified, they uh, bring this up to the professions uh, committee level for further vetting. And uh, they can also invite the CPD Council for deliberation if they want. We gave them a freedom on this. If they want to include the CPD Councils and, uh, and then they will submit this to the professional regulatory board for the final, uh, for fi for final uh, uh, endorsement to the commission and the commission confers the qualification title to the professional. So while we have the academic track, uh, we have uh, we are concentrating on the uh, on the professional track, which means that if you are registered and licensed, you are already on level six, and then if you reach a qualification level for specialization, you go to the le next level on se le level seven, and uh, more qualifications which will make you go to. Uh, which will make you an expert. If you are an expert already in a particular field, then you are uh, on level eight. And I understand that uh, for the academic track, it's going to be Ched who will be providing the academic levels. Um, and uh, so it will already appear in their certificates. And uh, for PRC, very soon we will be indicating the qualification levels in the IDs. In the PID, uh, in the PRC IDs, and so therefore the uh, IDs will just speak for itself on what qualification level you are in. And uh, this will give, bring me to uh, to the uh, to the continuum professional development, uh, the very controversial uh, continuum professional development. Uh, before this is the uh, this was what was uh, this is now the law and I'm glad that uh, President Duterte in his sauna mentioned that it has to be amended only not to repeal because as I mentioned earlier one of the requirements for us to qualify in the MRA is that we must have an institutionalized CPD program in place and uh, uh, of course uh, we will our professionals in the registry will also be compromised. I, uh, I uh, also agree that CPD should be developmental and it should not, and it should not be a mandate for uh, renewal of license. Although we can say now that in the proposed bill, uh, we have strengthened the law. We are strengthening the implementation of the CPD program as a necessary component in the implementation of the career progression and specialization program as well as in the credit accumulation and uh, transfer and transfer system. So uh, this is still in the on the hearing stage, especially for now at the Senate. It's now on the Senate uh, level. And so this brings me also to those who do not have uh, those professions which are not in the MRA still, in the ASEAN MRAs, the uh, PRC uh, came up with an alternative initiative for mutual recognition arrangement, and this is what we call the mutual recognition of professional qualifications or the MRPQs. It is an exchange of information on professional practices or competencies and benchmarking of professional competencies, standards, and uh, qualifications. And uh, also for which similar similarities and differences will be established for the purpose of bridging identified gaps and communication 
on consultation of, with professionals and our counterpart professional organizations, as well as collaboration with regulatory counterparts, as may be established in countries other those among the ASEAN member states. So uh, these are the uh, professionals, professional uh, professions which have, uh, which are in the MRPQ programs. And uh, we have also, uh, we have also initiated a strategy and this is a professional branding program of the PRC. It's a project wherein the PRC will promote enhance and boost the outstanding achievements of our professional of our Filipino professionals via social media in the local and international scene as uh, because there are some laws uh, professional laws in the country that will prohibit uh, advertisements self advertisements uh, they uh, and says uh, they it is uh, said that it's unethical for that to be done so uh, what we're saying here is that PRC will do the boasting. Tayo yung magyayabang sa ating mga professionals. And uh, I hope you will all help in this uh, uh, in this project. And uh, so, uh, I agree that professionals must be more de de uh, developmental. I agree with uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Teresa uh, that it should be uh, more developmental and less of regulation. So with that, I would like to thank you for inviting me here. And if there are questions, I will be ready to answer them. Thank you. Thank you too, ma'am. Uh, Commissioner Reyes, for that uh, very informative, for your very informative um, comments. Uh, I actually, uh, going through your, uh, going over your slides, that on the mutual recognition of professional qualifications, I think that's very informative as the professions covered by that initiative refer to those uh, where we do not have MRs, MRAs yet. So in effect, we will have more professions that will be comparable across uh, both ASEAN and non-ASEAN uh, countries in terms of professional competencies, standards, and uh, qualifications. Okay, so our second discussant is uh, also from uh, the, La the La Salle University, Manila. And uh, he is the Vice Chancellor for Administration. He is um, also a lead assessor in the ASEAN University Network Quality Assurance Network and uh, serves as chair of the Commission on um, Higher Education's Technical Committee on Accountancy since 2014, as well as uh, a part of the CHED Regulatory Quality a regional quality assurance team since 2005. He is also a member of SHED's technical panel of business and management since 2009. He is likewise a member of the Philippine Interpretation, Interpretation Committee, which is in charge of providing guidance and interpretation for the accounting reporting standards in the country. Aside from his involvement in the AUN, QA, and SHED, he is a full professor at the Accounts Accountancy Department of the LSU and a certified public accountant um, in the Philippines and a member of the Institute of Certified Management Accountants based in Australia. Friends, Dr. Arnel Onesimo, sir. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Sheila, for that introduction. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to congratulate Dr. Tuliao, uh, Dr. Kudia, and Dr. Rivera for sharing with us a very timely and a very appropriate paper so that it becomes now part of our discussion uh, and preparing a roadmap for us to move forward. The pandemic has given us a lot of uh, scary news and a lot of uncertainties, and I hope that uh, discussing this paper and providing a way forward allows us some silver lining to uh, our current year 2020. So this afternoon, uh, let me uh, just share with you two things uh, as, I, because, uh, as I discuss the paper and the study uh, done by Dr. Stuliao, Kudia, and Rivera. First is, of course, I'd like to provide some insights uh, that they have and share with them the good news that they have shared with us regarding the study, right? This particular study actually has a, a two-prong approach, and the two questions that they ask, and I highlighted here the essence of the study that I had, are the readiness of the Filipinos to participate 
in this particular uh, MRA pathway for mobility of professional or skilled workers. And the second question is quite interesting. And how can we, if about the assurance that Filipino professionals are prepared in terms of competing also with others uh, in the MRA or the ASEAN member state? So let me first uh, uh, like to uh, highlight the insights that they have shared with us. I agree with the paper in terms of the general consensus that in terms of readiness, the Filipino professionals are generally comparable. I, I think Dr. Tulia mentioned that, that generally comparable means that we're not yet uh, better than others, but at least we are ready and uh, our readiness state is comparable with other uh, ASEAN member society, uh, ASEAN member states, and so far as uh, the following are concerned. I think the study scoped it such that they take, took a look at the upgraded educational systems that we have implemented for the past uh, decade, starting with the K-12, to the uh, release of uh, OBE uh, PSGs, or uh, uh, the standards for our uh, different programs under CHED. And likewise, they were able to highlight that our curriculum uh, are actually at uh, par with international standards. Most of the professional courses use international global standards regarding uh, the new curriculums that was released uh, three or four years ago for most. Likewise, they highlighted that CPD is in place, and I, I guess Commissioner Reyes highlighted to us and shared with us some good news that CPD is not just for compliance. You know, having... Uh you know, some difficulty here and exploring ways by which, you know, um, some harmonization in, or some uh, streamlining could be could be made. Uh, can we throw, can I throw this question probably to, we have, we have none from, um, Commissioner Reyes, please, any, any thoughts on this? I'm uh, when you renew your uh, license, we accept online. It's, we are online actually, but for other professions in their professional laws, that they require certificates of good standing in their professional organizations. Maybe PICPA is also one of them. I'm not sure, but some of the uh, laws would require, a, like UAP, like in my profession, in the architecture profession, we would be required to have a certificate of good standing uh, from UAP before we can uh, renew our license. So, and uh, actually UAP is also transmitting this online. So they can, uh, the professional can um, uh, get from UAP and they can just transmit it online to them and they submit this as part of the requirements also online. So everything can be done, done online. Yeah. Okay, there you have it. Everything can be done online. Okay, uh, our next question, let's hear it from uh, Dr. Vicente Paqueo uh, from PIDS. He asks, how do you empirically validate against market outcomes? Um, the standards used by... Uh, okay, how do you empirically, empirically validate against market outcomes the standards being used for MRA quality assurance and qualification standards? So, Dr. Oi, would you like to, uh, in the case of um, um, accountancy profession, and then I can ask, um, we can go to Commissioner Reyes after you. Sure. Um, I'd just like to um, get clarity on the question itself. Uh, empirically validate market outcomes, uh, the standards used by the uh, for MRA and quality assurance and quality stand qualification standards. Uh, I think the MRA proceeds from the fact that each country will have their own uh, 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 quality assurance system and requirements for licensure, and for baccalaureate degree. Remember, uh, I think the MRA proceeds from there. The requirements that uh, Commissioner uh, Reyes highlighted in her presentation as well as reiterated in the paper. So to empirically validate, for example, uh, against all of these outcomes in the standards, uh, I think we can just check, for instance, the standards that are being used by uh, each regulatory board 
and how they're able to get a licensure exam, align it with perhaps uh, the competency frameworks espoused by global standard. And from there, that could be the uh, normative view, but the positive view is how it's carried out also in the different HEIs and after that, in the work uh, that uh, ensues afterward. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Oon. Other questions? Okay, this one is from Aaron Castaño uh, from uh, Open University. Um, he's taking up Master of ASEAN uh, Studies and he would he is seeking clarification regarding the holding of a professional license as a requirement to be a qualified ASEAN professional. What's the status of those who are degree holders but are not required to take licensure examinations such as board um, examinations? Uh, any, any, anyone, any of our uh, uh, speakers can, uh, can uh, answer this? If, if Dr. Uy? Um, any, any thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that maybe we can consider in the paper as well as what uh, was highlighted by Commissioner Reyes is the case of tourism professionals. Uh, I think there's no board yet on tourism professionals, yes. uh, but yet uh, when you take a look at the MRA, it proceeds from uh, an understanding of a framework that will allow uh, qualified practitioners or professionals to also be part of this mobility around ASEAN. And I think that's one of the examples that we have. Uh, I'm not from the tourism area, but I understand that that's uh, the challenge that is actually uh, being threshed out as they now formulate mechanisms to operationalize the MRA. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, other questions, and these are for TRC. So... Commissioner Reyes, uh, here are some questions from you from Richard Ballester. Uh, first question, should we strengthen further the PRC such that the powers of the professional boards be given back to the PRC and that the respective professional boards be just concerned with the standards uh, such as the content of professional exams? There are two other questions from the same person. Perhaps you can you can focus first on this first question, ma'am. Uh, well, the professional regulatory boards are under the PRC. They're under the supervision, supervision of the PRC. Right. Supervision, but they have direct powers over the professionals. But still, all the actions that uh, they do, they submit it as a res in a resolution form for our approval. So there are times that uh, they would uh, they would uh, request for something, and then we would check also the uh, the uh, industry, and then we would have we would have to make them uh, communicate. You know, sometimes there are issues like that that uh, some uh, some boards would have to implement some uh, rules or or uh, sections in their laws or in their RIR IRR. And uh, which have not been implemented in the in the past, but it's in the IRR. And then the of course the uh, the uh, professionals now will be surprised why all of a sudden this is being proposed or being implemented. So we would come up with some measures where we can say, for example, some grace period or some more communications, some more you know things like that. They are still all under the uh, supervision of uh, the PRC. And uh, also regarding the uh, quality of uh, questions or, or uh, regarding the examinations uh, that are being given uh, by the different boards, we have, a, uh, we have a table of specifications and we have several consultants also who would help them uh, formulate the questions or how to formulate questions and how to uh, and where to uh, the uh, well, where to get all of these uh, questions? Um, if I may interrupt, uh, Commissioner Reyes, are the questions in the licensure examination disclosed immediately to the public? No. Why not? Today it is not uh, disclosed, but I think before I, I remember it was uh, being given out. But for the teachers, for the teachers, uh, there was a request for them to disclose some questions. So, uh, and they agreed. They agreed to disclose five questions each, uh, each uh, subject. So, uh, 
for teachers they do they do they do as requested you know the reason why i'm asking this question commissioner reyes is because you know the members of the examination board are not perfect they make commit mistakes and so this is now a challenge to higher educational institutions to correct you know any mistake so then they will be more careful in uh, giving exams so that that's the reason why i'm asking you know, this uh, this question yeah well i do not really have a problem with that uh, i remember even before that uh, the uh, board examiners were asking uh, questions for from the HEIs. They were asking questions what they can actually uh, base their questions from. Uh, but now that is not allowed anymore. And uh, we, we have our table of specifications and that is public. You can, uh, you can also check there. Uh, but we have very competent consultants who would check on the, uh, on the questions on how they are formulated. And then we have also uh, some uh, degree of difficulties. We have an easy, moderate, and difficult uh, type of questions. So uh, these are all uh, indicated in uh, as agreed in the resolution, which uh, we have to follow. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you very much, Commissioner Reyes. And uh, Dr. Tuliao, this uh, next question, let me uh, throw it to you, if you don't mind. Uh, I do. Because, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's about uh, um, you you mentioned earlier you emphasized the need to beef up our uh, re the research capacity of our professionals and this next question also from uh, Rich Richard um, is on um, he is asking if we should relieve prof professors or instructors with their administrative duties or obligations in order for them to concentrate in R and D and innovation works. Uh, right now, we know that SOOCs are overburdened with administrative tasks. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on this, uh, Dr. Tugel? Well, that is the standard practice anywhere, okay? Uh, you know, you, at UP, you get deloaded. If you do research at De La Salle, at Tineo, you get deloaded for doing research because of the importance of research because it's time consuming, okay? Mm -hmm. So of course it's very expensive. Some of our, you know, uh, uh, best researchers are the full, full professors and it, you, you only allow them to teach one subject per term and but they receive, uh, you know, uh, the same salary. So, but we have to do this. And that's the reason why, you know, uh, private educational institutions cannot only do this on their own they have to be subsidized also by the government in terms of the knowledge production that they are do they're doing because research and development is a public good okay mm -hmm. you know it's not the it's not only Ateneo or UP that or La Salle that benefits or Santo Tomas but the entire country benefits, okay? Uh, you know, I often say this to uh, my colleagues, okay? It's, we're not competing with Ateneo, we're not competing with UP. A point for UP is a point for the Philippines. A point for De La Salle is a point for the Philippines. A point for Ateneo is a point so we should collaborate and can cooperate, you know, in increasing, you know, the wealth of knowledge, capital, and business. Thank you well, very much. Don't sir. ask me another question. Uh, thank you, sir. I can see uh, Dr. Uy uh, nodding his head. Uh, sir, uh, would you like to share your thoughts on this? And in the yeah. uh, field of accounting, sir, um, Dr. Tuliao showed us earlier a slide in which for uh, the accounting profession, um, indicator of knowledge capital, number of publications, um, he, uh, he gave us uh, 146, Very yeah, 146 only, which is, you know, um, well fine. below, you know, um, compared to the output of other countries, so. Correct, yes. 
Yes, I agree. Uh, I think to do research, uh, the professors are actually the key resource for that. And I think the reason why we uh, become professors uh, is because of that, first and foremost. But you have to understand, uh, I, I agree with Dr. Tuliao, uh, generally when you have a point for making contributions uh, in research and innovation, that's a point for humanity in general. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I guess there's also the aspect that the role of a professor right now has actually multiple facets. Number one, you're first and foremost an instructor, instructor or teacher because you need to teach. Second, you have to pursue also and do research on your own. That's an added task. The third is actually also about if you are called to do administrative uh, work like what we have uh, in different universities, SUCs included, um, you also contribute there simply because you know the trade. But there's a third, the mission that we have to, uh, the fourth, I mean. So I think we need to create the balance here. And one of the things that I see as a silver lining to all of this is that because right now there's a salary standardization, I, I foresee that most more people now will have a second look at becoming professors as a, a career uh, compared to how uh, lucrative it would be for industry to, uh, to join industry first. Uh, I think moving forward with the standard, uh, salary standardization law uh, and uh, allowing of, uh, professors to uh, get paid at par uh, with what industry would pay will actually create that mass, uh, critical mass for us to also do all of this work teaching for one, research on another, and third, of course, would be uh, for us to do administrative tasks. So I hope that uh, laws like this that encourages people to pursue this noble task of teaching will actually help uh, create that critical mass for us to move research moving forward as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Oi. Okay, there is a question here for you. Uh, and this is for from Lorraine Ang Fang, no? Uh, Dr. Uy, this is about the tourism uh, profession, yeah. and he's asking mm -hmm. about the specific test, the qualification <laughs> under tourism um, that should be aligned with professional standards. Yes, yeah. Uh, I think Gwen answered that already from chat. <laughs> the next slide, I think uh, Gwen uh, replied to that. It's in particular, housekeeping, front desk, food production, travel okay. services, and packaging. Now, but, but, but I guess my point also here is that there has to be a mechanism for continuous dialogue. Because once you have aligned this, it doesn't mean that it will continue to be aligned. Because there are changes and there are developments. And I think that mechanism should be in place for aligning also continuously uh, test desk programs uh, and standards and how it actually levels up to shed standards uh, in terms of education and professional qualification. And then later on, if there are some in the professional track, how it aligns to uh, the other professional tracks as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Ray. If I may just uh, uh, read this, read the, um, uh, the response of uh, Marites Ramos because it was um, it was forwarded to all panelists, not to everyone. Regarding the recommendation of Dr. Uy about the alignment of TESDA competency standards with professional standards, TESDA has already aligned some of its programs for tourism under these MRA for tourism professionals, such as housekeeping, front office, FDS, food production, travel services, and tour packaging. And this is ongoing. Thank you, Marites. Okay, moving on, uh, we have other questions um okay well this is the third question actually of richard uh remember we have we have two questions earlier from from him what are some of the things that we should change or incorporate in the national budget circular 461 regarding promotion within the SOOCs? i think uh his um this is about you know um uh promotion within um, uh, our public um, universities and, and colleges and perhaps we can we can um, we can part this and go to other uh, more related questions we have one here from the FA ASEC Univer Mahidum West uh, and we got this from our Facebook 
The Philippines is the current chair of the ASEAN Education Ministers Meeting as well as the inaugural chair of the recently established ASEAN Tibet Council. What recommendations will you address to them? Um, Dr. Tuliao, can we start from you, sir? Okay. Uh, instead of uh, mutual recognition arrangements, yeah, because that's all for regulated uh, professions, I think we should operationalize and move forward about the ASEAN uh, qualifications uh, reference framework. Mm -hmm. Because that will cover all scales, okay? Mm -hmm. Regulated and non-regulated. The only reason why we have this mutual recognition arrangement is because the practice of these professions are domestically regulated. But what is more important is comparability of skills. That if you're level one in one country, you're level one everywhere, or you're level six in the Philippines, okay? You're comparable to level six in Thailand. So, mm -hmm. so uh, I, that, that's my, you know, my recommendation. Move forward and uh, hasten uh, the ASEAN uh, uh, qualifications reference frame. Thank you. Salamat, Dr. Tuliao. Commissioner Reyes, any thoughts? What yes. You wait, wait. To... No, 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 wait. I, I have a... Yeah. Yes, uh, my recommendation here is for these uh, uh, professionals who are not regulated to attend your international uh, uh, counterparts to attend international congresses of your professions or of your field of, uh, of of your field. If you attend your uh, as a group here, usually you will have uh, local organizations, and these local organizations would be members of international organizations. When they come up with international conferences or congress, you attend that. You network with them, and then you start. You, you, actually, you can be officers there, and then you can start forming, uh, coming up and uh, proposing some uh, mutual recognitions. It could be bilateral, trilateral, it, and you can base it from what we have already, such as the MRAs or, or the MRPQ, the one that we are saying that we, not yes. within the Asian member states. We can share that with you. So uh, you start by doing that. Be leaders of your own Field in the international front. That is what we want to happen, and that is what I am always uh, uh, adhering and uh, initiating, uh, advocating in the PRC and even the APOS that they become the leaders of their professions in the international world so that they can somehow dictate or get some more information and they can get uh, give some more information. And, and you know it's going to be the it's going to be a bonding of kinship so be out there and be leaders of your field thank you very much ma'am dr oi any thoughts sir? yes yes um i think right now it goes without saying that we are supposed to be a global citizen too and as a global citizen i think that's where we belong to the world to humanity the pandemic is one good uh, example for us to see that whatever contribution we have in, for example, coming up with a vaccine, benefits the whole world. Uh, and that's actually where perhaps the issues of uh, MRAs or certain um, uh, uh, regulations or uh, agreements that will cross border will actually uh, need to be revisited because uh, of this particular concept. I agree with Dr. Tuliao. Qualification framework allows us to maintain standards of quality assurances across the world. I mean, that's actually one reason why we adopted the AQRF and we have a PQF law. Uh, second, I think also becoming part of the global uh, discussions will allow us to also contribute our thoughts and shape the kind of profession and competencies needed. Uh, I think if we stay silent, that's actually somehow one way of trying to abscond or relegate our thoughts to somebody else. And I think that's the reason why uh, publications and research is a key and important ingredient to achieving this. Because discussions moving forward starts with a paper, 
start with a thought, start with a hypothesis or a proposition, and from there discussions uh, follow. And I think that was what uh, Commissioner Reyes was alluding to when he said, continue to participate in global conferences. But when you go there and participate, I think it's good to have a particular proposition at hand. That, is, that becomes now the discussion and the opening that we need for us to continue to contribute to this. Thank you very much, sir. Um, there's uh, this question on um, professions or fields with no MRA yet, such as the teaching profession. And Jimmy Ray Cabardo is asking, what is the current stand of the PRC with respect to uh, uh, the teaching profession, uh, um, given its status right now that it has no MRA yet? Doc, um, Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, actually, the teaching profession is one of the uh, uh, professional or, or our uh, is one of those who have an MRPQ. MRPQ. So uh, they are they have already agreements with mem uh, ASEAN member states. Mm -hmm. So since they are not yet in the negotiating table of the uh, uh, MRAs, they are they are uh, uh, communicating or uh, coordinating with their counterparts mm -hmm. uh, within the M uh, uh, within the AMS countries uh, within AMS. Yes, Commissioner Mr. Reyes, yeah. if I may ask, are, is the teaching profession regulated in other ASEAN member states? Actually, there is. Uh, I am not. I am not very uh, privy to uh, the uh, teaching profession in the other member states because it's not part of the of the of our of our uh, AMS uh, negotiating MRAs now. But uh, in my in my uh, uh, what we have uh, in the MRAs, even in architecture, even in engineering, there are some uh, countries. Our member states like Cambodia, Laos, and Brunei, uh, they don't don't have any PRAs yet, and they are establishing it. PRA is the professional regulatory authority of the country, so they would like to adopt uh, a PRA such as PRC and uh, the many other uh, MA, a, a, AMS in the uh, in the negotiating table. So, marami pa rin, many countries would not have uh, this. So maybe uh, the professional teachers may not be regulated in, all, in all, also in these countries. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. Okay. Um, we have another question here. Uh, this one is from John Redmond de la Vega. It was mentioned that ASEAN MRAs are implemented vis-a-vis -vis respective domestic regulations of each AMS. You're right. Uh, what are specific existing regulations within those MAS or ASEAN member states observed by PRC or our other experts that possibly hinder mobility of um, uh, Filipino skilled professionals? Uh, Dr. Tuliao, can we have your response first? Okay. Uh, the first place, uh, well, I only know uh, the Philippines, okay? We have the economic needs requirement. You have uh, labor requirements, you have immigration requirements. And for the Philippines, it is reciprocity requirements. We may, okay, liberalize, okay, okay, and allow entry of foreign professionals. But if other nations are not willing to liberalize theirs, then we will not accept. Okay, so that's it. That's why. The uh, sufficient condition is uh, the domestic regulation. And then, of course, under that is what we call reciprocity. That's right. That's, uh, that's very clear in your concept, the conceptual framework of your study. You have that uh, box, you have that box, the, the middle box on transnational issues, no? one of which is uh, the domestic regulations. Dr. Uy, any additional thoughts, no. sir? Yeah, I agree with Dr. Tulia. It's reciprocity. I'll give a clear example, for instance. I did mention this earlier. Um, um, accountants 
uh, perform different roles and different jobs, right? I mean, if you are a CPA, you can actually do the books, you can do financial reporting, or you can also be an external auditor, right? An external auditor is a requirement by law to uh, be submitted by companies when they are submitting their annual financial statement. Now, in the Philippines, uh, CPAs normally have also some uh, requirements that they are Filipino citizens because they take accountability and responsibility for that. Now, if we impose that, then that actually also presupposes that other countries will not be able to do the work of an external auditor and sign audit certificates. Right? I mean, that's an example of perhaps reciprocity and how local regulations may be reviewed uh, in light of this. I'm not saying that we should all the time. What I'm just simply saying is that this is an example within which local or domestic regulation need to be revisited. And of course, there are other ways to, to be able to uh, uh, circumvent or at least uh, address this issue. Uh, but that's a different topic altogether. But I guess that's one uh, ex example of uh, how local regulations will create that barrier. Thank you very much, Dr. Oy. Commissioner Reyes, ma'am? One thing that I failed to mention in the uh, qualification requirements and recognition mechanism uh, in the in my paper earlier is that is the compliance to local uh, laws and uh, domestic regulations. Uh, for in our case, um, we would require for the uh, architecture and engineering uh, professions. We would require local counterparts. Meaning, if there is a local, uh, if there's a foreign architect coming here to practice, then he must get a local counterpart for that person because only Filipino citizens are allowed to practice here, and they are the only ones who can sign and seal the plans. So uh, they will be accountable, the local counter, the local professional, because uh, therefore the foreign professional will come in as a consultant. So that is the agreement. That is why in the AMS, in the in the Asian uh, MRAs, it's easy. Actually, in uh, in the APEC, uh, in the APEC uh, negotiating panel, uh, the well, US, Australia, and uh, Canada are are batting for a no counterpart requirement, and which most of us in the ASEAN would not agree. Well, because first it will violate our law. And the number two, uh, after if we if if our law will be uh, revised or amended because to give way for that, then it will be very disadvantageous for us because uh, after the project is done, the foreign architects is out already. They would uh, be out of the country. So the uh, accountability issue is not uh, it, it does not protect the uh, the best interest of the client. So uh, that's why uh, in the APEC, it's different situation. We cannot agree on, on that aspect yet. But for the ASEAN, uh, that's our uh, agreement for most of us. And, and our domestic rules will be uh, to have counterparts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very so, much, Commissioner. Uh, if, if I may add to uh, no, Commissioner uh, uh, Reyes, so the practice of profession okay, is not allowed, but uh, uh, the definition or the interpretation of mode four is that you have to be aligned with a domestic uh, a company. Uh, so a soul of light of a professional okay, coming here is not allowed. It's, it's, is that my understanding, uh, Commissioner Reyes? Yes, correct. That is right. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, we are down to our uh, last two um, questions. Uh, we're supposed to end at four. Okay. So this one is from Francis Ilia Ian. Well, he's asking of uh, whether there is one website for job postings that are open in ASEAN. Country sort of siguro as a uh, job portal ito of all the um, uh, employment opportunities or employment uh, vacancies open across ASEAN countries. Uh, meron, meron ba nito? Uh, 
are you aware of uh, the existence of such kind of a of a facility uh, commissioner? Well, uh, not that I know of. What we have in the website are the requirements on how to be ASEAN uh, professional, professional and what ASEAN MRA is all about. So if you're interested to be to be one, then you can visit that and then do a self-assessment. And then if you submit, we will evaluate. If you qualify, we, we will interview you. So there is still an interview portion. So it's quite tedious. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And for our uh, last question, we have uh, one from uh, Mr. Uh, Dan Agustin of the Masaganang Sakahan. And I think this was also uh, covered by uh, our discussions. No? So what strategy should the government and private sector adopt so that we will be at par with the fourth industrial revolution, I think, in terms of you know having a competitive uh, uh, professionals, competitive workers, uh, Adapt, that are adaptable to uh, the demands of the fourth industrial revolution. Dr. Uwe, uh, can I can I start from you, sir? Yes. I think for each profession, in the context of our discussion here, we need to identify the role of uh, the industrial revolution and the impact uh, to the services and uh, mm -hmm. the kind of uh, work that they contribute. I'll give an example for accounting, for instance, in our field. Yes. In our field, well, Industry 4.0 creates for us uh, mechanisms to expedite some work that are algorithmic or procedural in nature. It does not actually uh, overpower or uh, substitute the kind of analytical and critical thinking skills that are there. Hence, if you take a look at the impact of Industry 4.0, there's a need to upgrade perhaps our thinking skills or competency level to highlight those that are unique in our particular uh, field of expertise. But having said that, this has already been addressed when we now try to operationalize the qualification frameworks. Because in the qualification frameworks, that already highlights, for instance, the level of uh, skills, creativity, innovation, and even multidisciplinary or cross-disciplinary uh, perspectives that we need in order for us to achieve level six in the baccalaureate. And that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why in CHED, for instance, the way that we are able to formulate PSGs or program standards and guidelines is that we take a look at OBE as a framework that will allow us to become adaptable, but likewise align it with uh, the standards of each profession as mandated by the uh, global discussions that we have regarding this. HAT, for example, is a, a global thing. Higher order thinking skills, for instance. So that actually is my short answer to the impact of Industry 4.0 and how we can align government regulation. And second will be the private or the HEIs and how they are able to create capacity and capability for them to be able to implement this uh, program standard in their own localities. Thank you, uh, Dr. Oy. Um, doc, uh, Commissioner Reyes, uh, would you have anything to add, sir? Ma'am, uh, for example, in the field of um, architecture, is that your um, expertise? You may have some insights. Well, in architecture, we have already a lot of platforms, which makes a lot which makes our work a lot easier in architecture and engineering, uh, as a matter of fact. So before, while we use uh, T-squares and uh, pens, pen and inks, now it's so easy to, uh, to correct uh, plans and uh, perspectives and all that because of this, uh, because of, uh, and of course coming and, uh, and, and the uh, advent of the, or the coming in of the uh, uh, Industrial Re uh, Revolution uh, IR.0, it's it's going to be more and more easy. It's going to be a lot easier for us to be doing our. But it will, of course, it will never, it will never uh, take the place of the creativity aspect yes, of right. um, the brain. Yes, You're right, um, Dr. Tuliao, sir. Okay, thank you very much. You know, this is my cup of tea. Okay, Industry yes. 4.0. 
I did a study on the, the key uh, countries who are uh, leading Industry 4.0. These are the United States, China, Germany, Japan. And I look at their research production and what are their leading research production. These are in engineering, computer science, chemistry, physics, biological sciences, social sciences, and environmental sciences, okay? Now, where are we in this scoreboard? That's my point, okay? So if we want to participate in Industry 4.0, we have not only to prepare human capital, but we have to expand our knowledge capital in these key areas that are being used for interconnectedness under Industry 4.0. So again, research, research, that's my plan, okay? So it will last forever and, you know, I'm almost 70 and I guess by the time I'm 80, uh, I'll be speaking about this. But having said that, you know, 10, 20 years ago, I was singing the same theme that PRC should be developmental and they should have gradual okay, uh, certification. And I'm happy that Commissioner Reyes has mentioned after 20 years old, I know it's not my recommended, but I have, you know, sounded this 20 years ago, that you should use the medical profession as a benchmark. You start with an intern, then you become a resident, then you become a fellow, and then you become the expert. Okay? And uh, I guess PRC is doing this for the entire, for all the professions, which is a good sign. Okay, so who knows? Before I die, this country will be great again. Okay, sir. Okay, just to, um, uh, to uh, cap off our um, uh, Q and A, if I may request our speakers for um, brief messages you know if they ha still have um anything more to say starting off with uh commissioner reyes ma'am final words for you have any well again uh thank you for inviting me here i also learned a lot uh and uh thank you for uh allowing us to share what we are doing in prc i have uh i agreed with uh with the paper of uh of Dr. Liao, that's why I didn't, didn't dwell on it much. And uh, uh, I, I suppose that we just have to really join our hands in making sure that our professionals gain the recognition that they need. As a matter of fact, when I was doing the uh, orientation on the career progression and specialization program, I was telling the our boards, our APOS, and our academic people that, uh, you know, we have the AQRF and uh, and uh, the next thing that we will know now is a survey of how many professionals in each of the professions are in level seven. How many say in accountancy, ilan ang nasa level seven in the Philippines? How many percent? How many percent are in level eight? That would be the next uh, survey in the coming years. That's why I told them I will be, we will all be looking at you because you are the ones who will make it happen. And you have to really hold hands and we have to boost people who are already up there. Hindi na uso ngayon yung, uh, uh, ano ba ito, yung talangka mentality. We have to really put everybody, you know, push up. Uh, and that's what we want to do. And uh, we need a lot of professional branding uh, activities that uh, we, can, uh, we can get. So uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, allowing me to be here. And uh, I, I also, I saw in one of the questions, if uh, there are points for credit points for uh, okay. this uh, for this uh, uh, webinar, I understand this is your 26. And if you are a, an accredited provider and you are with government, actually it is free to uh, it is free to uh, register with us to be accredited. You can be accredited for free, 
and then you just uh, register in one of the boards where you will be most uh, comfortable with and then you can you it's going to be easy it's going to be uh, you will be given uh, you will submit only your programs and they will uh, and also your suggested credit points and uh, they will work on it it's going to be automatic so uh, uh, please uh, if, uh, if you are interested be accredited with our with any cpd council and uh, and then you can have all of these uh, webinars because we're learning a lot from them uh, be given credit units for cpd Thank you very much for that information, ma'am. And we are um, we are honored to have you in our uh, virtual event this afternoon. Dr. Uy, sir, any uh, final uh, words po? Yes. Would you like to share yeah. with our um, participants? Um, thank you for uh, Dr. Tuliao, uh, Dr. Kudia, and Dr. Rivera for sharing with us a discussion point. For all of us who are attending this particular webinar, we are all stakeholders here. I hope that we're not just here to enjoy and hear and get some inputs, but I hope that we can process and produce outputs as well. I always believe that being Filipino is something to be proud of. And I think the study on how we are able to contribute uh, to the professions that we are part of, not only in our country, but also in our region, but mostly in our uh, globally, is something that we can all aspire for and work for. Aspiration and work are the two components that we need to move on and move forward. And I think the silver lining in the pandemic is that we are given time to take stock of all of this and try to make a resolve and do something about it. So again, thank you very much, Dr. Tuliao, Dr. Kudia, and Dr. Rivera for sharing with us this discussion point on how Filipinos are generally comparable in terms of readiness, but we have the stance to continue on moving forward and moving uh, upward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Dr. Rivera, uh, Dr. Oy, <laughs> Arnel Oy. Okay. okay. <laughs> and of course, last but not definitely not least, our um, speaker or resource person for today, Dr. Tuliao, sir. Can, can I have 15 minutes for my valedictory speech? Okay, but anyway, that, it, <laughs> you for your class at four o'clock. <laughs> no classes are suspended because of okay. uh, academic. Uh, but th the point is this, okay? If that's the case, sir, we can. In, in, no, uh, in our discussion, we've seen that there are many problems in implementing MRAs. So some people are saying, why do we put too much resources in the formulation of MRAs? And my answer to that is, it is an avenue for improving the human capacity of Filipinos. Even if other countries will not accept us because of their domestic regulations, we will still improve our education. We will create new knowledge. We will form human capital and we will hasten our social capital. With that, thank you very much. And I hope you will not forget the name Tuliao in 2022. Good afternoon. Good afternoon too, sir. But all my answer. <laughs> Okay, friends, what a, um, an interactive uh, and uh, informative discussion that we just had. So please join me in thanking our speakers, Dr. Um, Dr. Tuliao, Dr. Uy, and Commissioner Reyes for the insights that they have shared with us in this webinar. So let, let's give them a, a well-deserved uh, big virtual clap and also thanks to those who participated in our Q&A. And at this point, I would like to announce the two winners of our poll for this webinar. They are um, Celica, Celica Balingit, and Maria Lisa Hernandez. Uh, each of you will receive this uh, PIDS uh, notebook. 
us five guaranteed seats to our webinar on November 26, and our team will get in touch with you for your mailing address. Okay, at this point, I now turn you over to our president, Dr. Celia Reyes, for her closing remarks. Ma'am? Ma'am are you there? Ma'am Okay. Okay, guys, so before we finally close, just a few, uh, just a few reminders to um, all of you. So first, uh, you can access all the presentations from today's webinar from our website. Uh, the uh, link is flashed on the screen. In addition, please also answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen right after this webinar, and we will also email you the link after the event. Your comments are important to us to improve our virtual events. Also, um, do regularly visit our website and our social media pages. Again, we'd like to thank all those who are tuned in uh, this afternoon uh, via Facebook and also via Twitter. We are live tweeting this event on our uh, Twitter account. And um, in addition to that, uh, next slide, please. Uh, would like to, in, um, to let you know about our webinar, our uh, last webinar for uh, November. And this is uh, next week, November 26, and we'll be talking about the role of the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation or the APEC in Philippine Trade and Investment and will feature two um, PIDS studies on this topic. And finally, we would like to thank all the um, agencies, or all the organizations that have uh, supported us in this, uh, and join us today, uh, those from uh, government, academe, uh, civil society, business, and international development community. And you can see their names, the names of these offices on the screen, and we will continue to flash um, those slides um, after uh, we after uh, the end of this uh, event. So friends, uh, this concludes our webinar for today, for this uh, week. Uh, we hope to see you again on November 26th. And let us continue praying uh, that there will be no more strong typhoons in the coming weeks until the end of the year, okay? Please stay safe and healthy and stay informed too. Thank you once again and enjoy the rest of your day. Maraming salamat. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Sana ko, please.